When you hear the word troglodyte, you probably think of someone that's ignorant and bullheaded, like TJ. However, troglodyte originally just meant cave dweller. While this way of living may seem primitive, certainly wasn't unintelligent. In fact, burying homes deep within the earth might even be our best chance of survival in this increasingly extreme world. Living underground has more amenities and possibilities than you might think. So today, crazy ways of living underground. Get deep, Everett. Deep of the Fright. Oh, yeah. I mean, hey, you know, you see a lot of these movies where, uh, you know, the, or the surface world is a fucking in shambles. And you have to go underground, dude. That's how it yeah, that's moved how it on to a, become a subterranean fucking species. You we got to go right? down. This, this whole episode is kind of born out of just like me and uh, my wife kind of jerking each other off about like the possibilities of buying a piece of land and having any kind of house we want on it. And, uh, you know, me being an old fucking hobbit hole fan, I was like, well, what, 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 what's a hobbit hole run? And turns out, like, depending on where you get them. Uh, they're not that much more expensive and can actually be cheaper than houses that are above ground since they tend to be smaller. I've actually seen some people that have converted like old bomb shelters and stuff into houses, you know? So pretty cool stuff, you know, kind of piqued my interest. So I thought I'd pull an episode about it. And we're going to start the episode tonight in uh, Matmata, Tunisia. You got to share that screen with me there, TJ. Oh, shit. Sorry, bro. Hey, no big deal. Hey, what What are you doing, TJ? Boom. You drunk, TJ? <laughs> I'm drunk, Scotty. Oh, Scotty okay. drunk. Oh, I'm that, fucked up. That explains a lot. Scotty, you son of a bitch. You, you betrayed me. Ah! Did you right, roofie TJ. him, Scotty? Did you roofie TJ again? He's always. I didn't do shit. nothing. I wake up, there's fucking half my shit's gone. Mm hmm. Um, so, desert settlements in Tunisia have a wonderful underground home uh, style built to avoid this intense heat and strong winds that you get with the desert. Uh, While the coast of Tunisia has mild Mediterranean weather, the central and southwest parts of the country bleed into the infamously extreme Sahara Desert. So definitely not, uh, you know, Mediterranean weather. A quite hospitable environment, if I recall correctly. Uh, The population there has a long history of using the surrounding resources to build near-perfect dwellings for this extreme climate. Uh, The homes are made by digging a large pit, some 7 meters or 23 feet deep and 10 meters or 33 feet wide. And then around the sides of the pit, they tunnel a few meters in uh, before cutting artificial caves. So uh, Matmata has a handful of similar towns uh, spread all across Tunisia. Um, It's situated on a shelf of uh, sandstone that is soft enough to excavate with hand tools but sturdy enough to provide homes for centuries. People have been living like this in this area. So yeah. kind of interesting. Whoa. I mean, you know, if you're, if you have, I mean, like, like you said, you know, you have the sandstone environment, you know, I mean, you don't want to necessarily be exposed to the elements. Caves naturally are, you know, cooler than the surrounding area. Yep. You know, they have like that whole cave effect and stuff. And this is essentially uh, a neighborhood. You know? Yeah, you know like what I mean. Got, they build a big, you dig pit. a big pit. You dig the f- fucking homes into the sides right. of the pit wall. You and, dig out in the middle here. Yeah, I mean, everybody like, shares like a little central courtyard. You know what I mean, where they can chill, grill some barbecue up at night or whatever. That's what solar panels looks like too. Yeah, yeah. We got a little solar power going. So oh, didn't have that in the old days, but you know they got them now. So hey, um, in uh, this small South Tunisian Berber town, Matmata, that we're covering, uh, a number of the local residents live in traditional understown, uh, underground troglodyte structures. Uh, some of the homes are made up of multiple pits that are then connected by passageways. So it's like it's not just like one big room cave that everybody's living in. They dig intricate right. rooms. They make a whole house out of it. You know what I mean? Under the ground. I have a. I actually recently watched a video. I don't know if it was in this region. It might have been uh, somewhere else, but I did recently watch a video of two guys that uh, dug a whole house out of the ground. They basically they had a built structure on top, and then underground they had this underground structure that they just like carved away with some very primitive tools, like some sticks with points and stuff. And yep, 
they just chiseled away at it until they like chiseled this whole little like uh, structure down there. They had a, a like a a, ba- a bed base that was made out of the sandstone or whatever the material was, and all kinds of stuff. It was I mean, crazy. if you've ever if you've ever been in the desert, you dig a hole in the dirt with your hand, you feel how cool the dirt is just under the surface. You know what I mean? As as the sun bakes down, most of that radiation, you know, eventually gets bounced back up. And so these people figured out that like, you know, you don't need air conditioning. You can live pretty comfortably underground. It's pretty yeah. neat. Um, so the homes are grouped around this central courtyard like structure that you see here. And they're connected uh, oftentimes to other courtyards with even more rooms. It's kind of like a labyrinth. So the whole town has these open air structures that are courtyards, but you can get to them from other courtyards. Right. So you can go so through like a, a network of tunnels that connect different courtyards to one another. Yep. Little different fucking blocks. Perfect place buildings. to commit a murder, TJ. I guess I mean, so. Huh? Never know, how would they know it was you? I mean, I guess. I don't Dun, so. dun, dun. You don't think about these things, do you, TJ? Uh, I guess not. Not uh, very imaginative. Interestingly enough, the origins of this extraordinary place remain a mystery, although uh, the stories that are passed down by the Berbers that live in them uh, through the generations offer an explanation for the strange form of living. One of the most popular stories is that the village's residents were forced to build underground shelters to protect themselves from the attack of Egyptian invaders. Um, there was a myth that monsters emerged from beneath the ground to kill uh, land usurpers. So mm-hmm. it was like um, that spread amongst the Egyptian invaders. They're like, you know, yeah, hey, like, like if you scared you get- of like this underground shit. Oh, I don't trust that. There's monsters. There be monsters down there. Well, I mean, if you've not lived in this culture, it kind of does look creepy. Yeah, I mean, it would be definitely completely different from the way that you're used to living. And you can imagine, like, you know, these things kind of dotted around the landscapes, all these secret tunnels and shit. These I mean, warriors... other than at noon, you got some, I mean, you got a perfect, like, shading thing, other than, like, at high noon, when they're, obviously the sun is, like... Sure, but at that point, you're off and you know. you're back in the cave somewhere, you know what I mean, where yeah. it is hot. But for most of the day, this courtyard has a natural shading, you yep, know, because of the so. circular nature of it. So, yeah, it just occludes yeah. a lot of the sun on one side and then the other. So it, it also makes sure that everybody's door gets a little bit of sun during the day. You know what I mean? But not all day. Pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not generally known that there were even regular settlements in this area uh, besides wandering nomadic tribes until just over about 50 years ago. Um, impressively, the existence of this underground habitation was uh, a little known phenomenon until around 1969. That year, um, there was a huge rainstorm apparently in the area that lasted for 22 days and actually forced these people who had been living in these structures for hundreds of years to like evacuate ship. You know what I mean? It was too much rain for this structure to handle and it flooded them out. Um, In order to get help from the authorities, a delegation was sent to the local community center of the region in the town of Gabes. Um, The visit came as a surprise, but help was provided. An above-ground settlement of Matmata was built. And today, uh, most people in Matmata live off of tourism by arranging folklore expositions in their own homes uh, for visitors to enjoy. So there's a lot of tourists that come to visit this area, apparently, and they... Uh, right. They've, they've made little restaurants so in people, there. These and, people lived in this community for centuries, basically. Yep. Only really kind of coming to the public's attention in 1969, and then ever since then, uh, you know, they've they've mostly been living off of uh, tourist dollars. You know, just kind of showing people like, yeah, here's how you know we well, traditionally it's so foreign. Lived. It's so foreign to so many people. It's like, so oh, it's like wow. oh wow, people actually live like this. Crazy. Crazy. Wow. <laughs> Another big driver of tourism uh, is uh, undoubtedly this next little chunk. Uh, Mat Mata also gained fame as a filming location in Star Wars. Oh, oh right, yeah. yeah. So this this was uh, a Tatooine dwelling in Star Wars. Uh, you know, Luke's whole fucking house with his aunt and uncle there and shit. Yeah. All of that shit. And it's so uh, it's such a foreign concept to most people that it it is something that you could fucking be like, oh yeah, this is like how they live on this alien world, you know? Yep. Um. So yeah, of course, uh, if you're not a Star Wars person, soon to be Jedi named of Luke Skywalker lives with his aunt and uncle on Tatooine, which is like a desert planet. Um. And they have got these underground structures that they live in. 
Um, and this was all filmed in the Tunisian landscape. It was used by George uh, Lucas and his crew to create the desert world. Uh, Lucas reportedly felt the area's landscape and desolate habitat felt more like an alien planet than something found here on Earth. So it was a natural fit. Yeah, um, absolutely. Th- there's a hotel uh, that's uh, been nicknamed the Star Wars Hotel, fell into relative obscurity after the filming finished in 1976. But after hype around Star Wars and the popular culture really elevated it, it was revamped in 2000 uh, for the filming of Star Wars 2, Attack of the Clones. The same sets that were used in the original were redecorated and restored for Anakin Skywalker scenes of visiting Tatooine. And uh, since the popularity of the films has brought new fans to the Star Wars universe, um, the decorations probably won't be taken down anytime soon. So, right. I mean, you're already yeah, fucking surviving. Off of, you're already doing tourist stuff. You know, people are already fascinated with your way of living. The fact that you have something else that you could point to that's a gigantic cultural landmark. Like, yeah, this is where this scene was <coughs> shot. This is where this scene was shot. You know, so pretty obviously. Neat take a like a lot of pride in this kind of stuff yeah, if you're point. gonna go to tunisia anyways you might as well see the star wars tatooine sets it's unfortunate oh, yeah. um that tunisia is so close to libya and libya is such a yeah uh, not not a place that i you know kind of not a stable region right now but i think this right. would be a cool thing to go see you know what i mean um if were it safe uh visitors to the hotel <laughs> can stay in four of the five pits with the fifth being uh, turned into the restaurant for the hotel. Hmm. Uh, The rooms have been restored by Star Wars fan Philip Vonnie in 1995, who scratched away the limestone and drew exact designs that were found in the original film. So, um, Labor of love. I mean, I guess he's probably getting, he's probably made money off of it. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, It wasn't just the torrential rains in 1969 that broke up the Berber tradition that started moving people uh, of uh, Matmata above the ground. Uh, During the 1960s and 70s, there was also a modernization drive by their president, Habib Bourguiba. Locals suspect Bourguiba wanted to dilute Berber communities as he strove to integrate them into the Arab nation after uh, independence from France. Of course, the Star Wars fame also likely pushed them into modernization as the tourism just exploded, um, you know, after after that. Getting, uh, you know, subjected to a lot more ideas uh, ideas and different kinds of people and stuff coming around. Yep. Uh, still, there are some that choose to cling to their tradition, and they rebuild and maintain these uh, cave dwellings. Uh, there's still some embracement of modern technology amongst these families, such as u- utilizing solar, as we saw earlier. They had some solar around the rim to get electricity to run a TV, um, you know, and some appliances and stuff like that. Beyond tradition makes little sense to give up something that was so good at keeping their family safe from harsh winds, sun, and heat for centuries. So, I don't know. I mean, this, looks like, this looks like a perfectly comfortable fucking dwelling. I mean, as long as you don't have another fucking terrible 22 days of rain. Right. You know, I mean, you should be fine. It would probably um, it be way cool living down there. You know what I mean? It would stay cool in the hot summer and, uh, you know, rel- you know, you got your privacy, you got your different rooms. Looks Did like I mean, the X-Files. I can't tell. No, that's not Jillian Anderson. I thought it might be. Yeah, uh, not to mention, I doubt they went massively in debt to have this. Probably no. not. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, kudos to them for that. So this next one is kind of a, a weirder story, I think, personally. And it's a place I've actually been which is unique. You know, usually I do these kind of weird, but this one, this one fits. This is the Forestier Underground Gardens in Fresno, California. Um, and they've got a pretty interesting story behind them. Um, they're a series of subterranean structures built by Baldassare Forestier, uh, an immigrant from Sicily, spanning about 10 acres and considering, uh, consisting of over 100 niches courtyards patios rooms and passageways so baldessari forestier left his sicilian homeland in 1901 with a desire to uh, escape his wealthy domineering father and a dream to forge his own way in america so he traveled to new york uh, from new york to los angeles uh, he eventually landed in fresno home to how, some how that happened yeah i mean <laughs> like, like let me go from italy to new york okay la 
Fresno, right? Well, at the time, you got to imagine, and still to this day, it's got some of the richest farmland uh, and hottest summer weather uh, in the nation. And so it was a, you know, he was, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to make it big. He wanted to be a farmer in America. Be a farmer. Okay. That makes sense. And so he bought up, uh, you know, uh, some land in the area known for being some of the richest farmland in the world, let alone in California. Uh, He was intent on growing trees and grapevines. So he purchased a parcel of land, but to his dismay, he soon found that the land was just about useless for farming as he was kind of duped. It's mostly hard pan with little fertile topsoil. So he just bought a bad patch of land. Um, No good. Luckily, you know, he was probably backed by a lot of money. As I said, his dad was a rich guy in Sicily. So instead of just giving up on it, and tugging his tail between his legs and going back to Sicily and going, Father, I've made a mistake. I've bought hard pan in California. <laughs> um, he decided to, you know, just kind of go with it. And um, so he was a self-taught architect. He didn't, you know, it wasn't... Um, no formal training. Yet. No formal training at all. And he built all this himself. Um, he changed his dreams and brought an imagined underground oasis to life. Uh, So the awfully hot and dry summers in the Central Valley probably helped, too, in order to spur his quest to go underground. Forestier changed his plans and created a remarkable underground oasis that he had intended to turn into a spa for the public, but never did. It was really just his residence for his whole life. Um, Through his later building, uh, though his later building ideas may have been uh, affected by his very first job in America, helping to dig some of Boston's earliest subway tunnels. So he had no formal training as a builder, but he had dug tunnels before. He knew a little something about tunnel building. So he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to take the skills I have to to accomplish the task I need to do. And, uh, you know, I mean, honestly... It looks gorgeous. I mean, it's really I cool. Can't blame it. It's so damn hot there. So, the architecture yeah, is, why not? is actually pretty fucking lovely, especially for someone who's like self-taught. I uh, mean, it's a really it's neat place for sure. It does for sure. Um, he patterned his underground world after the ancient catacombs, which he uh, admired as a boy back in Sicily. Um, arches and passageways dominate the underground la- landscape, while the stonework crafted from chunks of excavated hard pan. Uh, provide stability and beauty, as T- as TJ said. Um, but unlike the darkness of the old world's catacombs, Forestier designed naturally lit courtyards. Uh, the gardens, while subterranean, have many skylights and catch basins for water. Uh, the dirt that was moved to create the large structure was utilized elsewhere to fill planters, create stones placed within the catacombs, and to level out other parts of the land so he could build better on it. I mean, this it. guy, I gotta say, like, this is like the <laughs> ultimate example of like, if life gives you lemons, kind of dude. I guess so. This yeah. Guy, oh shit! This guy literally fucking got duped uh, into buying. Uh, let's sell him some hard pan. He got duped into buying land that was just total shit, and then he took his fucking skills as like, I know how to dig tunnels, and he's just like, you know what? And I like the catacombs. Maybe I can do something like that. Just fucking. Couldn't accomplish the dream he Transformed wanted, so he's just like, completely. Chain, all right, chain, new dream. This is how I'm doing it. Dude was and fucking, fucking to hey, work. You know? Dude was fucking That's brilliant crazy. too. Like he designed basically like a natural air conditioner for the place. Um, the pathways and rooms were constructed with various widths to help direct the airflow by creating pressure as wind moves through the narrower portions and maintaining movement as it bounces off the slants and curves in the cavernous wall. So he designed it with the intent to redirect that hot summer wind that we get down into the underground and push it around the house to make it cool. Effectively thwarting Fresno's naturally insane. Dude, this guy deserves a medal just for that. Yeah, we've been, me and Jay have both been to Fresno in the middle of summer. It is hot as fuck. When I I flew into Fresno and they were just like, uh, temperature in Fresno was 110 degrees or smoky. I'm like, it sounds like I'm flying into hell. <laughs> yeah, know? hazy. It literally uh, sounds like I'm fires uh, have erupted everywhere. They didn't even say hazy. They just said smoky. I'm like, I'm flying into hell. Uh, what well, am they, I doing? I, while we were on different flights, when I, when I arrived there, it was, it's hazy. Yeah, my fucking captain just said smoky. It's smoky down there. 110 degrees, smoky. 
So he, like, what am I, where am I going? Why hell, am I doing this? <laughs> literal hell. A place where you have to live underground to survive, basically. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, okay. The conical skylights that he uh, designed allowed for hot air that rises, obviously, to be pushed out more quickly and for the beautiful. cool air to remain down below. Love it. Um, no plans were put on paper at all. He built each room and passageway came from his mind as he went. Um, and he used simple, simple farmer tools to do all this, by the way, he didn't have, you know, tons of excavator equipment or whatever the fuck he just did it. This guy is a fucking badass motherfucker. That's all I can say. I mean, what's this dude's name? Forest, Forestier. Forestier. Yeah. Baldessare Forestier. Forestier. Man. Fuck dude. That's crazy. I mean like the amount of work and just like the fact that he just did it intuitively and didn't have some kind of fucking master plan laid out. I mean, he definitely in his head, he had some plan. And the fact out, that it was but... like improvise, adapt, overcome with that shit. That this wasn't even his fucking, this wasn't even the dream he came there to pursue, but it's just like, he just fucking adapted I mean, to what he was given. I mean, I love that shit. And yep. as, you know, Paul said, he I mean, he's visited this. So it stands to this day, I'm assuming. Yeah, uh, it does. It's a California landmark and it's still owned by his family. So it's like a privately owned, privately maintained museum that's listed as a California landmark. So, they pretty are dope. closed pretty often. It's they're not open year round, but when they are open, it's really cool. You can uh, go through. You don't get to go through all of it either. They've got sections of it that are just for the family. So kind of neat. Of course, yeah. Um, so anyway, um, so about forty it, over over forty year span in his lifetime, he dug, chipped, and carved his personal monument to ingenuity. Um, by the time he was 44 years old, he had excavated and planted over 10 acres of underground gardens. Mm. Um, understandably, he preferred living in his cool underground oasis during the summer months. He ensured his comfort all year long by building a summer and winter bedroom, a parlor with a fireplace, a courtyard with a bath, and a well-equipped kitchen styled after earlier uh, early 20th century standards. Um the sign situated in the space that used to be the aquarium reads. Uh, he had a table and chairs under his aquarium where he would sit and read. Looking up, he could see fish swimming overhead. So he was even thoughtful when it came to shit like that. He created like a nook, a reading nook that was a an underground aquarium. So he could just... I mean, yeah, he had a whole aesthetic. To this. That's probably the best thing about this. I mean, everything on the property is just like... It, 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 there's a sense of beauty to it. It's like, it's, it's something you wouldn't see in many homes where it's like, he really made his home about like what pleased him. Yep. Uh, he managed the chilling weather, uh, winter weather, which by the way, that's another extreme about Fresno is it gets cold, cold, like, well, like snow cold, but it gets colder than the witch's tit here in the winter. So there's wide extremes. Oh, yeah. Um, so he, he would cover the skylights with specially made pieces of glass in the winter and uh, light the fireplace and let the hot air circulate around the underground house and keep it warm that way. So, <clears throat> um, And he was also a remarkably adept horticulturist. Um, fruit producing trees, shrubs, and vines were planted underground at various levels and microclimates with temperatures varying from 10 to 30 degrees Celsius. And he built it all to where it all, you know, like every plant had an environment that was the perfect environment for it to grow in its blooming season and shit so when you go wow. into this place it's not just his house you'll walk through these rooms and then you'll walk into basically a small underground orchard that was basically yeah. designed to just feed him and his family they could go and pick oranges and maintain all the orange trees but under the level of the ground and to have and um you know only not only design that but have it in sync with ash times that they need to be planted you know you need to get and some of these things i mean take some it's like like an apple tree for example that, those can take 10 to 20 years to even fruit mm -hmm. depending on the, the tree you're talking about so i mean that's just an insane level of dedication to just his property and just knowing everything and just kind of living in sync kind of, kind of just in lockstep with his environment and then almost creating that environment that he wants to live in it's pretty astonishing um, and he, they, he made it in such a way that you could harvest the choice fruit near the tops of the trees by just walking around to these various courtyards on the surface and plucking the trees from the surface as they poked out of the top of these. Con so it's just like an amazing invention. It's pretty crazy. Um, um, 
Yeah, grapes, by the way, grape vines everywhere. It's a perfect dank environment with, you know, the, just the right amount of sun for these grapes. So just huge, luscious bunches of grapes hang every around every corner in this house. So Sounds it's like just, a nice house to have. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really neat. I mean, you can imagine it's just like a paradise, man. You just walk around and pick the fruits of the world off of your trees, you know. Um, like I said, still owned by the family, but it is a national landmark. They do do tours through here. So if you ever find yourself in the unfortunate position of being in Fresno, it's one of the cooler yeah. things you can see. Yeah. I wish I had known it was there when I was there last time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I haven't been since I was in my 20s. It's it's something I actually kind of forgot about until we started looking into this. Um, Hell yeah. So uh, forgive me for this mispronunciation. Uh, mis- mispronunciation. <laughs> forgive me for mis- the mispronunciation. Listen up. I'm going to pronounce it by the bitch. And I'm going to mispronounce it. I'm going to limitate. But, 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 we're going to end tonight by talking about the Wilska, Wil, 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 Wiliska, Wiliska Wiliska salt mines in Poland. Wiliska. Or TJ should, you should be toiling there now, TJ. You should be cool. toiling in the salt mines I of Wiliska. I'm toiling in the salt mines. And if following Forest Deer, uh, this is a pretty hefty thing to say, but this may be the most beautiful of the underground structures that we're covering today. Um, this is the underground salt cathedral of Poland, one of mm-hmm. Poland's national uh, historical monuments and a UNESCO heritage site. Uh, and the, and begin- the source of your power, right? And the source of all my powers, <laughs> but we won't go into that. Um, the beginnings of the current mine are believed to have been primitively excavated after the discovery of rock salt deposit in ancient times. We we actually just did a show where we talked about how important salt was back oh, in yeah, the day. Very important. Yeah. Uh, in the Middle Ages. Salt was recognized as one of the most important staples in the food preservation industry, uh, leading to the advancement of salt mining technology and further excavation. The Wielska and Bosnia salt mines are located on the same geological rock salt deposit in South Poland, situated close to each other. Uh, They worked in parallel and continuously from the 13th century all the way up until the late 20th century, uh, constituting one of the earliest and most important European industrial operations. The mines were administratively and technically run uh, by Wilska Salt Works Castle, which dates from uh, the medieval period and has been rebuilt several times. Um, During the Renaissance, the mine was one of the largest business ventures in Europe. And it was around this time that the royal tourists started to flock to the mine, lured there in part by the developing Renaissance taste for humanism and culture And by the late 18th century, Austria gained control of the mine and brought new forms of organization and further technological advancement, many of which are responsible for the longevity of the mine. Um, The birth of general tourism in the mine occurred during Austrian rule. Um, They would just let people, because it was such a huge, vast, Uh, old... Let's see the salt mine, yes. It had been worked for centuries, so it's like, you know, you can't see anything like this. so intricate, right. Um, so deep and it's been worked for so long. Right. Uh, due to falling salt prices and the mine flooding, commercial salt mining was discontinued uh, in 96, 1996. Um, after that uh, point, preservation became the goal. Um, although its industrial significance isn't the primary attraction. Uh, far from soling as a function. Oh, what's there you go. Far yeah, from, I just, uh, uh, didn't load right for a second. Far from solely functioning as a, p- a place to extract salt, the mine is also a site of great beauty. Uh, an underground lake is found at its depth, uh, as well as dozens of statues, three chapels, and a cathedral that have, are just called uh, carved out of the salt granite. Um, so miners uh, over the years added to this. Um, so like I said, it was worked for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so they're, I mean, look at this place. They built. Uh, fuck this, TJ. You don't need to be sent here. It's too nice. Yeah. Hey, it's too late, Scotty. You already sent me there. Well, Dude, com- look at the accommodation and the meals. Look at that shit, TJ. It looks nice as hell. Yeah. I bet you can't go here. Yeah, I'm I know. Going, this is. Scotty. Fuck you. If if he does go here, we should make him dust it. Like well, it's his job to dust it all day. I you know have what to I mean? dust the mines. Come and see the mine, TJ. Uh, the climax of the tour is this vast chamber housing the ornamented chapel of Saint Kinga. 
Uh, every single element here from chandeliers to altar pieces is made completely of salt. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, that's it. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, you can do you a can virtual walkthrough. You can do like a little virtual walk through it if you want. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's fine. Uh, I don't give a shit about this. Get out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to start our underground journey. Cool. Wow. Neat. Seems Where do we go? It says walk that yeah. way. Whoa. Oh, oh yeah. We got to go down there. Damn. Whoa. That's this, shit, this is bro. crazy, man. It's all underground. And too. remember, all of these are made, all these chandeliers down here are salt crystal chandeliers. Wow. And Let's go look at this, these uh, carvings more closely. Yeah. Carved out when of they, the salt granite. The chosen one gave the salt. Wow. This is all carved right out of the wall, too, huh? Yeah. Most of it, anyway. All of it. It's shiny, dude. Yeah, carved yeah. out of what used to be the mine shaft. You know what I mean? Um, this is a place of pure don't salt. Don't get too close to this. Dude, this is, is the power of salt, dude. If anyone ever challenge you in the power of salt, Paul, just show them this cathedral. But I mean, like, this, this is, is the well, house. This is the cathedral. Salt, so, yeah, they won't let you walk up on the altar, I guess. But, oh, man. The, dude, yeah, that's where I sacrifice. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, where, that's uh, where some things happen, you know. This man. is where P uh, Paul goes to pray and contemplate. Oh, is this guy? Is this the Paul? Lord of Salt. Uh, you Paul can't here. look at that too closely. That's that. No, 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 pay no attention to that statue. Pay no attention to that statue. Uh, what's going on here? I think it's the Pope or something. <laughs> yeah, it does look like Pope John Paul. Yeah, it does. It's uh, still a Paul. Um. So yeah, pretty cool places. That's pretty cool shit, man. Pretty yeah. cool underground dwellings. And uh, who knows? Maybe They're all I'll end located up in places I ne I I wouldn't necessarily want to go for any other reason. But hey, they're all pretty fucking you never cool. know. Yeah, I mean, it might be worth it to check out uh, some of these places. Especially this one. This is fucking yeah. This beautiful. is crazy. Um, do you can you imagine living in this fucking place? It'd be crazy. <sighs> you feel like a king. I mean, I already do. Just even looking at the fucking pictures of the fucking thing, dude. I would hold court in this fucking place at that altar, oh, yeah. dude. Come forth. Dude, you, Paul, you would look cool as fuck standing at that altar and be like, come forth, salty children. Come to me. So you've been looking to start your cult. This is where Give you got to do your offerings to you Paul. You need some kind of fucking salt palace, dude. We're going to have to get a, like a paramilitary organization to storm this. Yeah, take this take over. Take it. Maybe anyway, after the collapse, you can get it, you know? That's some cool. underground dwellings. If you like this, let us know in the comments. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, y'all.